webinar. This is in a series of our monthly webinars on agile topics. Today's topic is measuring agile's economic impact. And as usual, if you're having any issues in the audio or for that matter, being able to see the webinar screen, just please raise your hand in the Q&A panel of the GoToWebinar and uh, we'll see what we can do about it. In the meantime, I'll assume all is well in terms of audio and video. So the topic today is measuring Agile's economic impact. Uh, so all of you who've been following um, Agile process for software development, our observation is with our clients and, uh, and other companies we talk to in the process of our work, that most development teams have done a good job over the last several years. And remember, this is the 10th year of the Agile Manifesto that uh, the practice of Agile has become more and more well established and, and teams know, generally know how to follow the right things and all that. So today we wanted to lift the discussion up a level and talk a little bit back about, about the, the, the real economic argument for following Agile and, and actually talk a little bit about how the process of Agile software development really facilitates and actually enables organizations to more sharply and clearly uh, understand the economic impact of software development, looking at both the investment and the and the and the payoff side of it. And I'm delighted to have Damon Poole, one of our regular presenters in this series. He has done a Kanban webinar in the past and and a, and a webinar on modern software te techniques with us, and both have been very uh, well received. So I'm glad to have him talk about uh, this topic of measuring agile uh, economic impact. Damon is the founder and CTO of Accurip, which is a leading provider of agile tools, and he's been practicing software development and, and, and process improvement for over 20 years uh, and has worked with both small teams as well as, as thousands of person distributed, globally distributed teams. So he's a perfect person for us to be uh, helping us understand this topic. With that, uh, before I turn it over to you, Damon, let me just quickly uh, give a little quick house rules, very simple. Uh, we will we will post this uh, document on our website uh, by tomorrow. Uh, if not later today, and you, you'll, all of you will receive an email uh, informing you of that. The second thing is, by and large, we'll take questions towards the end, but on the other hand, if the topic is such and you want to, you have burning question, feel free to type it into the Q&A panel here, and, and I will keep track of it, and, and where and needed, I'll inject that question along the way. But otherwise, we'll take all the questions towards the end, uh, and uh, hopefully have a very good discussion. With that, over to you, uh, Jim. Okay, thank you very much. That was a fantastic introduction. I, I didn't realize this was actually the third in the series. Uh, I'm really flies. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. So uh, uh, there's a lot about me there. Um, just want to quickly talk about uh, Acura, the company I work for. So we produce um, uh, software configuration management products that are optimized for agile, uh, traditional development, and hybrid. Um, and we basically help you automate uh, and enforce your uh, development process. So you can find all about that uh, on our web. But today I'm, I'm going to be talking about Agile. Um, a lot of our customers actually are either Agile or going Agile, and here's just a, a few of them to give you an idea of, of the kind of companies that, that we work with uh, and how they rely on us. So, you know, I always like to start with a, a, a single key takeaway to, to get out there, what's my main point, um, and then circle back to that at the end. So, I believe that Agile enables organizations to focus on serving the market efficiently, right? We often think about how can we be efficient in our development process, but it's harder to think about how can we serve the market efficiently, right? So what does that mean? Really, at the end of the day, it means how can we um, produce the most value for our organization with the resources that we have? Obviously, one of the ways to do that is to reduce costs. But looking at the top line is really going to be part of the main focus of my presentation. So in a nutshell, here's the overview. We're going to talk about ROI. We're going to take a look about what do we really mean by ROI. We're going to look at the R in ROI, which is really cost. We're going to calculate cost the agile way to see how you can still calculate cost and how it's actually a little easier. We're going to think about who your customer really is. Many IT organizations um, consider the business unit their customer. And we're going to take a look at a different way to do that. Then we're going to go back and look at the R part, right? Because if I can reduce costs or increase revenue, those are both good ways uh, to produce more value for my company. There are three different ways that we can do that that we're going to be looking at. Uh, reducing waste, maximizing value, reducing cycle time, and then we'll bring it all back together. Okay, so return on investment, that's sort of the basic thing from an economic perspective. 
right? So we have our investment, the amount of money that we're going to invest in something, uh, whatever it is, which is going to produce the software uh, that produces the value, right? So the, the value uh, comes from the software uh, some way, shape, or form, right? That's why people are making the investment. What is the return? Well, there are a couple of different ways to look at that. You could look at it financially, and uh, right, if you're looking at uh, your business unit as the your internal business unit as the customer, then that return is not necessarily financial. Uh, you know, revenues it's funding for your your department or for a particular project. It's budget. But at the end of the day, whatever the return is, whatever the investment is, that's your ROI. So you can work on either one to get that to be a higher ratio. Um, now. The way that I like to look at this to sort of bring this home is to think about uh, scratch tickets. The features you're developing are a lot like scratch tickets, right? You know how much it costs, right? Uh, there's the $2 ones, the $3 ones, the $4, the very expensive $10 ones, and maybe they'll pay off the way that we hope, but we only know the cost when we're creating that feature. We don't know the return, the value on that until later. Now, if we have a contract in hand, we could think of it that way, but uh, that's what we're being paid, right? So to us, that's the value. But to the actual customer, what is the value? That is hard to predict, right? So maybe you develop something perfectly, you give it to somebody, and they say, yeah, okay, we paid you on the contract, but you know, it just, it's, it just didn't turn out the way we hoped, and you know, we're not gonna do business with you again, right? So focusing on value is actually very important. In, in uh, summary here, predicting the return is hard, cost is easy to measure. So let's look at how you measure cost in an agile environment, right? Because that's going to be the underpinning for everything else that we do. So traditionally speaking, and that's a good place to start, right? We've got our requirements, that's our scope. We come up with a plan and we have a release date. From that, we're going to get our cost, right? And the, the cost is on a per person basis, you know, how much are they fully loaded and, you know, this resource costs more than that, et cetera. So you multiply that against your plan and you get your cost. Maybe some of those people are only part-time, maybe some are full-time, whatever, but that's how you calculate your cost. And that's fairly laborious, right? There's a lot of accounting and spreadsheets here and how much time did I spend on this and, and all that kind of thing. But we can do it, we know how to do that. So how do we do that in Agile? All right, so in order to, to show you that, I'm gonna have to introduce some new concepts. They may not be new to everybody here, uh, but I'm going to uh, quickly go through them as though they are new. So we have our stories, right, user stories. And to some degree, those are like requirements, but they're called stories. And we're gonna agree as to, you know, what stories we're gonna do. So from the stories, we're gonna form a backlog, which is a prioritized list, and I'll get into more of, of that soon. And we're going to say, all right, at the top, that's the most important, at the bottom, that's the least important. And we're gonna pick a, a time in here that's our release date. All right, so the first one, two, three, four, five iterations there, that's actually what's gonna be in that release. From that, we can calculate our cost by taking iterations, the number of iterations we have, in this case five, multiply it by the velocity, something we haven't talked about yet, but that's what we do, then multiply by the cost per uh, story point, and we'll get into what all these are. But this is the basic formula, this is the framework that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, one more thing here is that this assumes something called a cross-functional team. Now I've introduced a lot of terms here, and I haven't I haven't uh, defined them yet. I'm going to define them now, but I wanted to show you the overarching uh, framework, and we'll revisit this as well. So, user stories, story points, cross-functional team, backlog, iteration length, velocity. Those are the things that I introduced. So now let's introduce them to you, and then we'll circle back. All right. So. single English phrase that produced all these requirements. Hmm, it could be a uh, shopping cart, uh, amazon.com. Um, actually, what was asked for here was, as a user, I want to order what I am browsing with a single click. Right, that's very clear and concise. In general, a user story is of the form, as a user role, I want to achieve some goal. So in Agile, the reason we do this is because it's really easy to quickly glance at this and say, oh, I know what that is. Look, looking at this is a little harder. So I can look at this and say, I know what that is. That is gonna be our headline, the uh, basic unit that we use to keep track of what we're doing. We're gonna assign a cost to this, we're gonna assign a value to this, 
and this is our you know our basic interaction here okay so this is our you know basic unit of work anything we're going to do is in, is going to be in the form of a user story now uh, much like a requirements a defect and enhancement request we need to have some sort of estimate of how much work it is to do some work you know how much effort is it going to take so we can figure out the cost so a common thing to do in agile something I highly recommend is to use story points now story points do not equate back to time uh, we're going to have to calculate time in order to calculate cost but it's done indirectly when we're going to use story points story points measure the relative level of effort of a user story and it takes into consideration all aspects of implementation uh, development test and user documentation uh, GUI work uh, back-end schema design middle tier stuff whatever you need to do um, you need a cross-functional team to do that and we're going to use all of that together to come up with the estimate right um, and that makes it really simple to calculate the cost per story point and we'll see how that works but story points are the basic unit here that we're going to use for an estimate. So consider that you need something to be done. And I'm going to use a, a, a sort of a, an example outside of software development. Let's say you want to dig a ditch. And it's, uh, you're laying some pipe for a town or something, and it's a half-mile ditch you need to dig. Um, and then there's another ditch that is a mile long. Right? So the mile-long ditch is approximately twice as much effort as the half-mile. So if all you do is a half mile and up, then you could think of the half mile as a basic unit, as a one, and the mile as two, right? And then uh, you could have something three times as hard, five times as hard, whatever. So that's a relative measure. What that does is it disassociates who's going to do the work from the work that needs to be done. And actually calculating the cost, again, that's going to be indirect, and we'll get to that. But what it does is it separates out the fact that you may be using different people with different skill sets uh, to do the work. So think about it this way. You need to dig a ditch, and you've got this, dig, dig, this ditch digger, right? So that's going to take a small amount of time, or you may have this gigantic one. That's, uh, it's going to go pretty quick. But the job itself, if it's a half mile or a mile, is independent of who is going to do it. And that's what story points will do for you. So I mentioned a cross-functional team. Uh, what is a cross-functional team? It means that you have all the skills here, right? So I've got a tester, I've got a doc writer, I've got a scrum master, I've got a manager, I've got a developer, product owner. All of the functions, all of the skills that I need to get the work done on a particular project. Um, also self-organizing, but that's a whole nother, uh, that could be a whole nother topic right there. So this team is going to be estimating uh, the user stories in story points, and they're going to be doing the actual work. So we know who's going to be working on these projects. And ideally, in an Agile team, these folks are not shared across projects. right? So their entire salary and uh, fully burdened overhead, uh, fully loaded, loaded overhead, is going to go into calculating the cost here. It's going to make it a lot easier. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take all these user stories uh, for this project, and we're going to put them into something called a backlog. The backlog allows us to rank by business value the work that we want to do. So often, you know, you might come in and say, all right, we need to do all of this work for a project. It's all important. You know, there's nothing that's more important than the other thing. It, it's no value unless I do it all. But in general, that's not really true. There are different requests and different stories here, different requirements that have different business value. And so that's one of the main points that I'm going to be making here today is you want to think in terms of value to the business, the economics of development, not so much the cost side and the efficiency side of, of getting that work done, though that is also very important. All right, so here we have the points estimated out for the stories, but the business value, that's a little trickier. You know, what is the business value of this story versus the other one? It's not always easy to figure out. But generally, you can say that this one, even though I don't know the exact value, has more business value than that one. So we're going to rank them from most business value to least business value, however you would do that in your organization. You might have a business analyst that do, would do that, product owner, product manager, somebody like that. All right. So once we have our backlog, we're going to break that up into iterations. And an iteration generally would be something like uh, two weeks or four weeks or one week, but it's going to be consistent. 
based on um, based on that, I can break this backlog up into sections. How do I do that? Over time, I'm going to establish something called a velocity, which is how many story points I can get done in an iteration. So for instance, if my iteration is uh, two weeks, like in this example, perhaps I can get 20 story points of work done. So um, you know, maybe I have a, a story that is to implement um, you know, pieces of an online survey system, and one is a true-false question, another is a multiple-choice question, and let's say they're both two points. All right, so there's four points. So I would need, you know, uh, 10 stories kind of like that. I can get that done in two weeks. That's great. I can do, you know, 10 more of those in the next, right? So I've got a cadence of how much work that that team that's working together can get done in each iteration. All right. So um, that's, I've got my backlog. I've got my iteration length picked out. I've got my velocity. What's next? Well, what I can do now is I can calculate the uh, cost per story point for a team. And how do I do that? I'm going to start by going to my CFO, my controller, and say, hey, I've got this cross-functional team, and maybe they're virtual, you know, they don't necessarily have to be sitting next to each other, but they're all working on the same project consistently. And he'll come back and say, the fully loaded cost for this team is this amount of money. And this is actually a real dollar value for one of our um, uh, Agile teams here at Acura. Um, it consists of um, a number of developers, QA folks, um, part of a Scrum Master's time because they're working on multiple teams, part of a product owner's uh, time, and part of a manager's time who's managing multiple projects. But the QA, dev folks, and doc folks are all fully uh, dedicated to that team. So he said, all right, here's the fully loaded cost of that team for a year. Great. I know that their iteration length is two weeks, and there's only so many weeks in a year. So that means that they've got 26 iterations per year. So every two weeks, that's an iteration, 26 of those per year, right? And I know that in their case, their iteration velocity is 22 points. So that's 572 points per year. Divide that out, for basically $1,400 per point, right? So what can I do with that? I can say, all right, I wanna measure this on an iteration perspective. All right, that's a really good thing to do. So if they're doing 22 points times 14K, that's about 31K. So once I have that metric established, I don't have to recalculate this all the time. I know that every two weeks that team cost me 31K, fully loaded, right? So if I wanted to do that same work somewhere else, um, it needs to be less than 31K, right? So I can reduce costs you know, uh, through various solutions, but it needs to cost me uh, less than 31K for that team if assuming I'm getting the same velocity, right? So that gives me some levers for measuring uh, what I'm getting from various teams. Also, it allows me to calculate, okay, if I want to do a release with five iterations in it, that's gonna cost me, okay, one, two, three, four, five, 155K, right? Very easy, I don't have to have all these complicated spreadsheets. I went to the controller one time, I got that number, I calculated it out. It's very easy for me to apply this on a regular basis. Another place I can use this is, if I'm looking at a story and it's a five-point story, um, I know that that's going to cost me uh, 1,400, you know, times five, right? So $7,000. If I think, you know what, I'm never going to get that $7,000 from the life of this story. Uh, that's for this one customer. They're going to use it for a month and then they're not going to use it anymore. I have to really question what what the value was there. Maybe I have to go back to that customer and say, hey, um, you know, we're going to have to talk about this because uh, the value just doesn't make sense here. You know, the ROI doesn't make sense here. But now it's very easy to calculate this. It makes it easy on any story that you're looking at to say, yes, this should be in this release. No, it shouldn't be in this release. Um, you know, it's not perfect, um, but at least you now have an easily an easy way to calculate the cost. Okay, so we got the cost. And it seems like the next thing to do would be to talk about the value. Uh, the return, right? But before we do that, let's reframe the whole ROI thing because I've noticed that actually when we talk about ROI, it turns out that we are only really talking about the cost. Now, why is that? So it turns out that the efficiency of individual process steps are easy to measure, right? So I can say, all right, you know, this person cost me this much, that person cost me that much, and you know, this person is producing this much and that person's, you know, et cetera. 
So actually what happens is because measuring value is so hard, my return becomes what percentage of my requirements did I implement? I implemented 100%, it's 100% return. I don't know actually what that value is, but it was 100%, what, what more could I possibly do? Somebody else decided what the contents of the release would be, what the, what the requirements are. I have no control over that. So instead, I'm gonna focus on cost. So cost becomes a proxy for ROI, which means that I'm not necessarily looking at uh, how can I maximize my return in development, I'm only looking at how can I reduce my costs. Increasing return actually requires uh, a customer and business focus. Now, I'm not saying that, that folks are not focused on that. I'm sure you are. But let's reframe that discussion, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. And let's also look at the different methods there are for gauging the business value. Okay, so the first question here is, who is your customer? If your software, if you have interactions directly with the end user of, of your software, right, and you have a number of them, um, and you can see the direct connection between their use and the software, okay, then you have a direct customer. If, on the other hand, you think of your customer as an internal business unit, and that they then have a market and customers that they serve, right, then, then you're thinking of that business unit as the customer, and of course you're focusing on them. But really, to be the most effective, especially from an agile perspective, you want to merge those together. So you have your offering, which is, con is consisting of whatever the business unit is doing, plus the software development group, merging them together into your offering that is providing services or what have you, software services, to the actual end user, the actual market and customers. That's how you're going to be able to focus on increasing your ROI. The business and development working hand in hand. Okay, so how can we increase revenue? One of the ways is by reducing waste. So let's look at some of that. Now, this, uh, this may seem a little obscure, but bear with me here. This is a very simple tool to think about the uh, value of a feature. This is called the cost of delay. So now you might be thinking that the market or, you know, it's easy to think of the market or prefer that the market stays still as far as the value of any particular feature. You know, we want to do this feature and we hope the value is going to stay constant, but it really doesn't, right? There's the time at which the market emerges for something, either your whole product or a particular feature, like uh, let's say that, um, you know, you're in the commodities trading and there's a particular way to uh, recognize revenue that requires changes to your uh, backend software and it's really hot right now. So you could say that there's a market for that, right? And when that emerges, there's also another time, which is when you decide to do it. You may look at that and say, oh, there are other things that are more important. Uh, or no, we're gonna do it right now. At some point in the future, there's gonna be that time when there's really not a lot more value there. Everybody has that, it's not a differentiator, you're not gonna get new customers by having that, right? So its relative value starts to drop off. And that may be a long period of time or a short period of time. So there's when you decide to actually do it and when the user can actually use it. And that's completely variable, right? So if you can turn it around immediately after you decide to do it, then the user can use it right away, right? So let's look at how much does it cost to delay that feature. And that's the cost of delay, right? So one of the costs of delays, and that's actually the one I'm gonna focus on, is the delivery day, delivery delay. There's a whole, you know, you could talk about the delay of how long it took you to decide to do it, right? If you decided to do it earlier, you could have gotten more revenue. But perhaps you had things that are higher priority and that's why. Okay, great, but this gives you a tool to think about it. Okay, so you decide to do it, and then the user can't use it until you deliver it. So whatever time that takes between you decide to do it and you deliver it, that's your delivery de delay, right? Any revenue that you could have gained if you had it out back earlier is gone, right? So what is that gonna cost you? Well, you don't necessarily know how to get that value, but whatever, whatever that you thought it was or were hoping that it was, clearly the longer the delay is, the less of whatever that value is that you're going to get. Now, many times people have a business plan that says that, 
you know, we, we uh, hope to get these revenues over this period of time and we're going to do X, Y, Z features. And so you can start to think about, okay, this particular feature I think is going to be responsible for this percentage of the overall value. So you can kind of estimate that out. And maybe let's say in this case, you know, for this particular feature, you think it's about 1% of the value and you're going to get $3 million. So, um, right, so that's uh, $30,000. So um, if I'm going to delay uh, over the course of the, that uh, time frame, if I'm going to delay it this much, maybe actually all I'm going to get is 5K. So clearly, I've lost a lot of potential opportunity here. That's one feature. Let's look at a whole bunch of features. Um, and, but before we do that, let me tell you a story. So I experienced this very painfully in retrospect um, in our own product. So in our own product, we had a way of uh, visualizing or uh, modeling the software development process of an organization. But there was no way to visualize it. So we would talk about, here's your process on the whiteboard, and we'll model it in our own system, and then uh, how developers move code around you know, will be influenced by that. But people couldn't visualize it. The uh, next release of the product, which took us a year to get out, you could visualize it, right? So here's a handy graph. You can see how your development is organized, right? It's, it's scalable. You can slice and dice it however you like. But when we released this version of the product, our sales more than doubled, more than doubled, right? And we went back and asked people, why did you buy the product? Uh, and they said, well, because of that visualization. It made it really easy for us to see you know, how our software process was organized and to, to use that to talk about our software development process. And it wasn't just a Visio diagram. And we said, okay, great. And it turns out that that particular feature, which was what motivated most people or many people to buy the product, was done in the first month of that yearly project. And if we had wanted to, you know, if we went back in time and we were using Agile back then, we could have delivered that within a month, right? That's something we could do today. So in retrospect, the cost of delay was 11 months of those new increased revenues. So that's a pretty painful thing. All right, so let's look at a whole bunch of them, right? A whole bunch of these curves, right? So at the top, I have uh, quite a bit of value over a long period of time, and then below that, uh, a lot of value for not quite as much time, but that's a couple of years time frame. And then another one that's, uh, you know, it's gonna take me a year to develop, but I'm gonna get value for a year. And then another one that's a, a shorter time frame, right? And then one at the bottom, it's almost like, you know, why even bother? This is just six features. You might have hundreds of features in your product. So you can see, right? Here's the cost of delay. All that red is revenue to, that I'm not going to get because it takes me a year to, do, to uh, deliver it. If instead I could do something incremental, right? So I deliver the top two quickly, the next two a little after that, and then the next one after that, um, I'm going to get all of the dark green revenue. Whatever that is, I'm going to get more of that revenue earlier. I'm going to be able to capture that revenue earlier. Plus, I can use that to make decisions like, you know, that thing at the end, why even bother? You know, by the time I get it done, its value is going to be pretty much gone. So this can help you look at the various features going into the product, think about it using this tool, and decide how am I going to order the delivery and, you know, which things am I not even going to do, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you, uh, you know, you have to deliver quite as rapidly, but you want to know that the things that you're delivering and the time frame that you're delivering are the things that are going to bring you the most value uh, the soonest, right? And anything that you're doing just because it seems like it would be useful to have in there, uh, but doesn't actually itself have a lot of value is going to be de delaying the time that you get revenues from all those other things that are very valuable. All right, so that's one of the wastes that's out there. There's another one that's uh, pretty clear and has been talked about a lot, which is pretty obvious, it's easy, um, is, okay, here's a traditional development uh, cycle, and this is over about a six, seven month period, specify, design, plan, code, et cetera. Now there's a study that says that, um, and not just traditional projects, but often in Agile projects too, uh, because sometimes we do an Agile project very similar to the way we do a traditional project. We do all the big upfront stuff, and then for the coding, uh, we do that iteratively. So this can all, Agile can also suffer from that, is that 60% of the delivered features are not even worth the cost of development. Now, I changed that a little bit, right? So the official study uh, from, I think, the Standish Group says 
60% of delivered features are not uh, actually used or are seldom used. I put that as they're not worth the cost of development, right? If they're not used, you've invested all this money, but you haven't gotten any return. So it wasn't worth doing it at all, 60%. Now that's not just the developer. That, you notice that that stripe goes all the way across and pointed that out that uh, the developer's time was wasted, the tester's time was wasted, the doc person's time was wasted, the executive's time was wasted, the product manager's time was wasted, all that time you spent getting those requirements wasted. Right? Now, it, now you might be thinking, well, how do, how do I know in advance? Good question. You, you don't necessarily. Right? That's why iterative is important, is to get some feedback and see whether you should keep going in that direction or not. And we'll talk more about that momentarily. The next one, which is even more painful, is I invest in all this stuff, and it's not that 60% uh, isn't used. The whole project was canceled. So everything I did up to the point that it was canceled was actually it's lost money. Right? And then there's the, uh, the term out there of shelved, which, um, you know, let's admit it, that shelved is a euphemism for canceled, but we don't want to admit it yet. All right, so when you cancel or shelve a project, anything that you did up until that time is all cost, no value received, um, and any cost savings that you did there, right, were wasted. So if you're gonna do all this effort to save uh, money, right, you want to make sure that that work is actually delivered. It's just waste, it lowers morale. And one of the most important points here is that you have missed opportunities. That time that you spent, all of that investment, if used somewhere else, would have had an actual return on investment. This one does not. All right, so you want to avoid that. And in traditional development, it's a lot easier to end up canceling something that's going on forever and there's nothing to show for it. So there's a couple more things here, which I don't have a lot of time to get into, but you know, I mentioned this earlier, uh, decision delay is actually expensive. Actually, the cheapest money that you can possibly find is to move a project earlier. If you knew, uh, and it's hard to do, but if you knew three years ago that there was something very valuable for your company to do, and you've only just now started it, and you're you know, a couple weeks, you know, you're a year into it, let's say, and you're a couple weeks behind, it was, you know, two years previously that you didn't use, which would be great, uh, you know, it's cheap money. If you'd started earlier, you wouldn't be behind now. So that's something to look at as well as um, seeing if you can reduce the amount of time it takes to get something started once you've decided that it's important to do. Um, you know, deciding that it's important to do is the first step, then deciding to actually do it is the step after that. So reducing the time between those two decisions is very valuable. Look at how much work are you doing to, to actually put something into production, to actually get it funded, right? to get not in production, but initiated and started. That is often one of the most valuable places to look to reduce your cost. Uh, next, when you delay something. Can right? we take one question um, which pertains to this particular topic before you move off from this topic? Sure. The question here is: uh, You showed those pictures where the features have a uh, have a uh, they, they become available in the market, and the market recognizes, and then the value declines over time. So the question is: How do you come up with how do the, how how can teams actually assess and come up with those, those estimates so they can actually be more thoughtful about planning and replanning their development if it, they see something? So how do you get the data? Good, good question. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, let me just quickly answer that question. Um, that's not always easy to come up with, but uh, there are a number of different methods that you could do. Uh, one is that you could get uh, the various, uh, you know, business uh, domain experts together and um, have them do an estimating of value, much like developers estimate uh, cost. So uh, we'll talk about some of those a little bit later. Uh, but at the end of the day, Really, that's a, a tool for you know for framing however it is that you're currently coming up with that value now, right? You're probably doing something to come up with that value now, or you have somebody, a product manager, a business analyst, a product owner, that can look at two different things and say, I'm not sure how much value there is here exactly, but I know this one is more valuable than that one, and I know that this one has a much longer um, uh, time, frame for being valuable. So if I look at these two features, this one is going to be valuable for years and years and years. 
you know, this is a, a, a huge differentiator for us. Nobody else is going to catch up with us in this area for years and years. So a lot of value here for a long period of time. That one, uh, I was just talking to somebody and a competitor is going to be offering that in six months. So, you know, the time frame for having that be valuable from a differentiation uh, perspective is much lower. Now, so at the end of the day, that's what your product management group is going to do for you. And uh, really, you know, what I'm providing for you is just a, a, a framework for thinking about the fact that no matter what the value is here, no matter what it is, clearly, the sooner I can get it to the market, the more I'm going to get that value, whatever it is, right? So whatever value, really, this way of thinking is whatever value you would have got by using Agile techniques, you'll get more of that value sooner. Okay. Great. Thanks. No problem. Uh, and often, being the first to market has a lot of advantages. So missing that, uh, you know, first to market is a big disadvantage. Right? So delay is the uh, important key factor there. All right. So again, um, there's, you know, there's no magic wand for calculating value, but if you have value, how do you maximize it, whatever it is? Well, there's a couple of different ways to actually measure it. Um, and measuring it is one of the most important ways for maximizing it. Because if you're not measuring somehow, and you have two different features, and you can't tell the difference between the two, and you work on both and release them simultaneously, um, <coughs> actually it would be better if you knew that one was more valuable than the other, release that one first and start getting that value as soon as you possibly can. Now by first, it could actually be as simple as many organizations struggle with just getting down to a six month uh, time frame. If you can in that six months do all of the things that are you know, the most valuable and then in the next six months do the things that are less valuable, that's way better than releasing them all together after a year. So some of the ways of measuring relative value so that you can then differentiate between them are what is the frequency of use by the end user, right? So if there's this one feature and it's used by, it will be used by everybody and another one that will be used by just one customer, um, do the one that's more uh, frequent. That has the most value. You know, you then have to look at the cost. It may be, you know, too expensive. Um, and don't think of the business unit um, work with the business unit if you have a business unit there that your customer and talk to the business unit and say, how often will this be used in the field? Help us understand that, right? So that together we can come up with the ROI. You know, what's the value to the customer? You can just ask the customer uh, and they may say, oh, this is tremendously valuable. Uh, if you added this, we would pay you more. We would order more. Uh, we would do more business with you. We would recommend you more frequently. Ask the customer what the value is for a particular feature, not overall, but feature by feature. And that, that could be hard to do, but I believe that there's a lot of value in doing that. Um, uh, lastly, how many of your customers need that? So talk to the business unit, right? So of our customers, of your customers, who are also our customers, uh, when talking to the business unit, um, what percentage of that market needs that, right? So these are some pretty straightforward ways of measuring the relative value. Now, as far as estimating value, uh, getting a little bit more precise, highly recommend Luke Coleman's book, Innovation Games. He's got some great games in there, like Buy a Feature. Um, we had him come in and, and do that, um, and it was really, it was really great. So the the basic idea there, and sort of the one that he uses at conferences and stuff, is you're gonna design a set of internet-enabled sunglasses, right? And, and so you give everybody in the group, you know, your customers some, some play money and say, you know, what features do you want? Do you want it to um, um, access, to be able to surf the internet? You know, whatever the features are, and you have, you have values for them, and then you have the customers go and spend their, their play money, and then you figure out that there are different kinds of customers in your customer base and that they value them differently. It's a fantastic uh, way to figure out how your customers value things. Generally, that turns out to be relative value, but having relative value is much better than not being able to distinguish between two things. Um, uh, use planning poker. If you're not familiar with planning poker, that's something that agile teams often use to estimate the cost of something. That can also be used by the business stakeholders to estimate the value. 
right? So uh, one person may say, oh, that's three points of value. The other person might say one. And now you have a, dis uh, a way to discuss it. Whoa, a three, why is that? Oh, well, I was just talking to these customers and, and uh, they said that the competition is coming out with this and they're thinking of changing, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, you can also, what I was referring to earlier, and I'll just bring that up again, often there's a business plan that uh, somebody's done a lot of research to say that we believe that this product over this number of years will bring in this amount of revenue. It may be wrong, but then uh, if you assume that that's correct, you have just one assumption that you can work on. And it may be wrong, but you got to start somewhere. So again, if you have something that says that this product is going to bring in 3 million years, uh, yeah, $3 million over the course of the next three years, and you look at any particular feature, you can say, what percentage of that value do I think that has? Multiply it out and say, okay, um, you know, using the, the same single assumption of, of the uh, revenue of the product over the three years, you know, this is the, uh, the value for this particular feature. So that's another thing you can do. And lastly, a combination of all of the above, right? So there's a lot of methods out there. But at the end of the day, the important point here is not accuracy of estimating the value, but rather having a framework for um, saying, okay, I'm going to get through these things uh, as fast as I can, right, with frequent releases. I'm going to try to order them the best I can, relatively speaking, and then whatever value you would have got, you're going to get more of it faster. Right? That's the most important point. Okay, so let's look again at our backlog. So um, we've done all this work to get better at uh, figuring out where the value is and separating it all out. And uh, we put this in the backlog. And again, the idea is the most value at the top, the least value at the bottom. Once I have this backlog, I'm saying this is the order that I should deliver in. And it may be hard to do some of these things, but this is the order that ideally I should do them in. I also have my points. So from this, I can take this and I can go a step further, right? I can look at all the stuff that I have in my backlog and I can say some are high value, some are low value, some are high cost, some are low cost. So for example, I might say that, um, um, you know, look at two particular stories. One is very high value, the other is low value, and they both are low cost. Which one should I do? Clearly the one with the, the high value, low cost, right? But then it gets more complicated. Uh, the worst one here is what if it's low value, low cost? That's really hard, right? That's the one that uh, you might want to uh, defer or potentially avoid, but that one's, that one's pretty uh, difficult. No clear uh, recommendation there. Then if it's high cost and low value, you want to avoid that, right? That's, it's, uh, it's not clear that you would ever want to do that. And then you've got the high value, high cost. Now, why not avoid those? Because it may actually turn out that you, you need to separate the wheat from the chaff there, that the thing that you're thinking of is high cost and high value is actually multiple stories. So if you can take something that's high value and high cost and turn it into a bunch of stories, some of which are high value, low cost, and others are low value, high cost, then you sort of made your problem simpler. Now all the things that are a piece of that that are low value, high cost, you can avoid those. That's not always that easy. But to the extent that you can, this is a great chart to follow. And the important part here is splitting. Splitting user stories down. The more I can split user stories down, the smaller I can make them, the easier it's going to be for me to make good decisions from an economic perspective. So let's talk about splitting stories, or as I like to call it, panning for gold. Because what is panning for gold? You get a pan. You got a whole bunch of stuff in it. Some of it's gold, some of it is just dirt. How do I separate out the gold nuggets from the dirt? Well, let me give you a concrete example here, one of my favorite slides. I like to work it into every presentation, but a different uh, perspective on it. So now I'm gonna talk about this from an uh, economic perspective for those of you that have seen this before. So there are two important bridges here, the two on the right, which have vehicular uh, cars going across them. They pretty much have the same purpose. Uh, one goes over a little bit more water, but it's pretty much the same purpose, same kind of load, and they're intended to both be there for quite a while. Um, so what's the difference? 
well, first off, this has a bolt on, right? That's kind of an interesting thing. It makes it more expensive. But the most important thing of the bridge on the right is that it's serving as a landmark. So the business value here is, is that it's a landmark. Um, now, ask yourself, do you know what the name of that bridge is? Most people don't. It's the Zakem Bridge in Boston. Most people have heard of other bridges, such as the Golden Gate Bridge. So its main business pro, um, proposition of being a landmark, maybe not fulfilled. What does this have to do with software? Think of that bridge as the software that you wrote to try to take into account every potential user need that anybody might ever have in the future. We're planning for the future, which is good, but who knows what the future will bring, right? So often you've got these features that are pretty much over-engineered. Now I'm not saying to build something that won't work. The principle here is the simplest thing that could possibly work. And if you look at that bridge in the middle, that is actually the simplest thing that could possibly work. Right? It's not over-engineered, it's just what's needed. So, here's the kicker. The bridge on the right is $11 million per lane. The bridge in the middle, $5 million per lane. Do the math here, that's $60 million that if you had built the bridge in the middle multiple times to serve the same traffic, $60 million you would have saved in that case. Right? So that's money that you can use for some other investment. All right, so you know there's sort of the general thinking of how to split things, you know that sort of philosophical thing. Now let's get down to brass tacks. Often when people are trying to break things down uh, to fit into Agile, they think of breaking it into layers. All right, I'll do the back end, the middle layer, the front end. How much are you going to pay me if I get that whole back end done? Nothing. Why? Because it's provided no value. Not until I get the front end done and the middle layer do I get that value. So let's look at this another way. Let's split by value. So I've got three user stories. Uh, the blue, you know, the surveyor wants to add a true false question. I have to do a little in the front end, a little in the middle, a little in the back end. Same for the, uh, the purple and the gray there. Now, normally we think about development efficiency. From a development efficiency perspective, I would rather do all three together because then I know I'm not going to have to rewrite any code. I can think things through, all that kind of stuff. But from an economic perspective, it makes more sense to just do the story that I most need first because I want to validate that I have to keep doing stuff in this area. If I don't, if true false is all I ever need, then actually doing the other parts is a waste economically from an economic perspective. If it turns out I need to do the other two stories and I have to rewrite some code because of, uh, I, I had some assumptions that were wrong, that's fine because the money that it's going to cost me to go back and change that code over time is going to be a lot less than the additional revenue I get from focusing on economic efficiency. All right, so splitting by value is a very important topic. All right, lastly, before I wrap this up, I want to talk about reducing cycle times. So reducing cycle time is another way to recoup value. So I've got the tr traditional project up top. I'm doing the Agile project, and I'm going to use these short iterations. And I've got these three things I need to do, Facebook integration, Second Life, RSS feed integration. All right, so I do some stories. I don't yet, and I'm going to focus on Facebook. I don't yet have it all, but I have a piece of it now. And I could ship this if I want to. Uh, to finish out the integration, I need to do another iteration worth of, of work. I've got it now. So I've got this piece. I haven't taken into account anything else that I might need to do for the other two uh, features. But then the world changes, actually, rather than Second Life, now the market is telling me I should feature on, I should, uh, you know, focus on RSS feeds. So now I can. I do a little bit for that, do another iteration. Now I have RSS feeds, and the world changes again. Now the world is telling me that photo SMS integration is the thing that I should focus on. And so I can do that. Right? So while from a development perspective that might be seen as a little inefficient, I'm getting gains on the economic side economic efficiency. So right, so the value that somebody's actually going to provide to me in revenue, uh, now this is no guarantee this is upside, but I'd rather have the upside, right, is saying that it turns out that by actually following what the market wanted, I could get more revenue in the same for the same amount of effort at the end of this uh, project. And if I can actually release frequently, I can start to get that value earlier. 
which means that reducing that time, that cycle time from, you know, whatever it is now to something shorter, in this example, from seven months down to one month cycle time, I can maximize my economic efficiency, right? So um, reduce costs, uh, sort out business value and focus on the highest business value and reduce your cycle time, bringing it all together, right? So often we think about the fact that, you know, individuals get paid directly, uh, but where's that money coming from? It's the old product. Anything that's unused in the old product, that's not valuable. The customer says, all right, these things are valuable. They're gonna turn that into some tangible asset like money and give it to you and put it into the company and that's how you get paid, right? How does anything that you do affect that? Well, if you're just coming on board, not much. But over time, you know, the company's gonna say, all right, here's what we need to do. Here's the thing that you need to do that goes to other folks, right? You, you've uh, increased the value there. It goes to other folks, they add value, and that creates a new product. If that new product never sees the light of day, no value is created. Shelved, no value is created. Only if it makes it out into the market do you start to see the value. And the way to think about this is reducing the, the cycle between I need to do something, it's ready to go, it's in a customer's hand. That is the thing that you really need to think about focusing on because every other thing that I've talked about today comes from that. It doesn't mean that you have to reduce the delivery delay, um, but you want to be able to uh, deliver the highest business value as soon as you possibly can. You decide when to deliver it, but having the option to reduce that, that's the important thing. So what would this look like in software development terms? All right, you got your customers, they're uh, you know, sending the requests off to the chief product owner. You got your user stories, your master backlog, your agile teams, you're shortening, shortening your cycle times, you're doing an agile workflow. In the end, you want it to look like this, right? Not the sort of traditional development of, you know, I work on stuff for a month for requirements and then I send it to architects and then, you know, I develop it for a long time and eventually I can release it. You want it to be as close as possible to this because from an economic perspective, this is the most efficient you can be. Take a request, put the highest value things at the top of the backlog, give that to the team, have the team be able to turn it around, integrate it in the product, and give it to the customer as soon as you can so you can get revenue from that customer. Okay, so key takeaways, you can read them right there. And uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. So let's uh, let's move on to questions. Great. Thank you, Damon. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn over to the questions page here. And let me bring up my PowerPoint so I can paste through. So folks, uh, uh, as you think about some of the questions based on the content that um, Damon has just covered here, I'll give you a few minutes to, to, to come up with the questions beyond what you have already shared. And in the meantime, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about Synergy, and I just want to make sure I can um, do this in a slideshow presentation so you can see the full slide. There you go. Okay, so while you're thinking about questions here, uh, is the introduction to Synergy, for those of you who don't know us, Synergy in a nutshell, we are a software development, product development partner for small to mid-sized companies. Uh, almost all our clients tend to be uh, typically venture-backed companies but at least small to mid-sized companies, and we provide them full software development lifecycle support to our team. And for each client, we have we put together a dedicated team based on specific skill profile required, the nature of work they want to do. And um, because of our experience with software development process, and uh, particularly the agile, we are able to really help our clients reduce the risk of development and be more thoughtful. As uh, Damon covered today, be more thoughtful about which features to build and how to build it in a most efficient way so they get the most ROI. And then uh, not only, and we amplify the ROI because of the cost advantage we are able to provide because of our dual short uh, development team, a development center in India and a product management team here on the US side. And the last point is the flexibility we offer our clients, which is uh, that once they start working with us anytime in the, in the relationship, they can take the team that is working for them, Synergy team, and convert it that to their own captive offshore team. So that's Synergy in a nutshell. Next page, as it refreshes on your screen, uh, it just gives a glimpse of some of our customers, almost all, as you see, are small to mid-sized companies with a few. 
uh, larger companies sprinkled in there and a few really small ones, but most of them are small to mid-sized companies and almost all are software product companies as you see. So with that quick introduction to Synergy, let's come take some questions um, uh, based on the content uh, that uh, they discovered. So Demo, let me get to the first question here, um, which is uh, you talked a lot about uh, the splitting the stories into smaller, higher value uh, uh, stories. And so do you have any guidance, first thing, on what would be considered a big story? So how would teams know when it is too big and when they should really be thinking about uh, breaking it? So that's one. And the related question is any guidance on, on, on how to actually break the stories? Uh, some people uh, are talking about the fact that it is difficult for them to break stories. So any guidance you can give about how to go about breaking big stories down? Okay, sure. To some degree, it's a little bit of chicken and egg. Um, if you uh, if you're on an agile team and you've been going for a year or two and you have that question, uh, it might be time for some outside uh, you know uh, coaching or uh, guidance there. But uh, generally, in my experience, that um, the more you do it, the easier it is to do, and uh, it's really practice because in traditional development, you know, when did we ever? have to break it down. If somebody says, oh, that's three months, and uh, product management says, okay, we got to do it, then it's three months. And uh, you might break it down into, uh, you know, small tasks. Uh, you know, I got this task done, I got that task done. But at the end of the day, uh, Agile is saying break it down in such a way that each thing that you do, that you break it down into, individually has customer value. And that's really the hard thing to do. But, you know, practice makes perfect. So. But let me give you a couple of guidelines. There's a lot more that are out there on the web. Um, if you search for uh, breaking down user stories, another one is uh, uh, sashimi slicing, and there's some stuff out there. But let me give you some uh, simple examples. So there's uh, you know this uh, fundamental principle in software de design called uh, CRUD, which is um, you know, a great acronym. But uh, create, uh, read, update, and delete. And often a lot of things have those components. So a simple example is um, I want to uh, have an online user survey, and I need to add questions, remove them, um, you know, have somebody look at it and delete it. But actually for me, uh, if I'm just getting going here and I want to test out the software uh, or give it to somebody quickly, having it just so that I can I could think of it as the first use as a, a survey designer. As a survey designer, Right, I'm going to get all my questions just right, and then I'm going to write it out on a piece of paper or something. That has some value. So for a survey designer, all I actually need is create and delete, because nobody's going to be reading it other than me, right? And uh, you know, from uh, you know, a uh, uh, search or a report or something like that. And so all I need to be able to do is create a question, and if I want to change it, then I delete it and add it again. Right, so I've broken it down. So CRUD actually breaking it down into uh, creating, reading, updating, and deleting is a good one. Another one is to just look very simply for the word and. Um, <coughs> I was doing some training for uh, folks on Agile the other day. And the example they were using was uh, the ability to um, uh, match up resources with folks that needed them for a tornado disaster in Massachusetts. It's a great example. And what they came up with was they wanted to be able to log in through um, you know, uh, regular means or Facebook or Google or whatever. So their story said, I want to be able to, as a user, I want to be able to log in uh, using uh, pre-established credentials like Facebook, Facebook or Google, uh, or even without that. So you had three methods. You had regular login without Google or Facebook. You had login via Google, and you had login via Facebook. And that's, you know, very clear. So those are just some simple examples and uh, I invite you to take a look around the web for other ways of breaking down user stories. It's in the end, though, practice, practice, practice. Excellent. Thank you. I think uh, we have a few more questions, but I think we're going to be unfair if we, given the time boundary that we run into, it's 1.59 coming on to 2. So I think I'll, I'll just have to stop here. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Damon, for uh, going over this presentation with, with our audience. And this is a very good topic. And thank you all for participating and joining us today. And look forward to having you all in the next month's webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.